This conference Welcome. will now be recorded. Welcome, everyone. My name is Melinda Bourgeois. I'm with Travel Central. We're here in the New Orleans area. And today we are very fortunate to have with us the Japan National Tourism Organization, who will be sharing all kinds of tips and tricks and talking about different things to do in Japan. We are also going to be talking about, at the end, about a cruise opportunity for March of 2024. We originally had scheduled for one in October, but Japan is so popular right now that actually the uh, cruise that we had in October is completely sold out, and the rest of the year looks pretty full for Japan. So if, I'm not, uh, if you're thinking about doing it, I would definitely consider looking now for the fall of this year or, or the beginning of next year because it is definitely selling out. The great news about the one that we're going to be sharing today, though, it is during the uh, Japanese uh, cherry blossom season, so it's fantastic. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and tell you a little bit about Travel Central, and then I'm going to turn it over to the Japan National Tourism Organization. Rose is here with me today. So Travel Central has been in business since 1988. Our only goal, uh, I think, we did we lose the pr presentation? Oh, it, it looks like it just said that the someone else became the presenter okay i just knocked them off so i apologize for that that's i okay. apologize to everybody somebody somehow got in there and did that and i okay um back to our thank there you for coming <laughs> so um, um travel central has a group of travel advisors and our only goal is to offer our expertise and our resources and knowledge from the very moment you call us to your return home from your vacation the great news for us is one advisor is dedicated to you. So when you call here, you'll ask for whoever is on it, whether it's Linda or Rachel or Allison, and they will actually answer all your questions about your vacations and be your advocate. In addition to that, we also work with an uh, international organization that can offer additional enhancements and special offers that, we, that, that you won't be able to get on your own. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rose, and she will share Japan with us. Thank you, Rose. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. So hello there, everybody. Uh, so my name is Rose Lifshitz from the Japan National Tourism Organization. Really happy to be here to speak to you guys a little bit about Japan. So without further ado, we'll just dive right into it. So as all of you are aware by now, Japan has been open to tourists since October 11th of last year, uh, lifting the vast majority of entry restrictions. So right now, the only requirement for entry is proof of a valid vaccination certificate for a full round of doses plus one booster, or a negative COVID-19 test certificate taken within 72 hours prior to boarding. Now, even more excitingly, uh, some news uh, hot off the press is from May 8th, Japan will actually be lifting these requirements as well, so you'll no longer have to provide either of these things when entering the country. And tourists itching to go to Japan have wasted no time hopping on planes to visit, like Melinda said, absolutely packed right now. So in February, Japan saw nearly 87,000 visitors from the U.S. alone, which is almost a 94% recovery rate compared to four years ago. So we're seeing a lot of foot traffic right now, especially for um, people wanting to catch those beautiful cherry blossoms. So it's safe to say Japan is very swiftly recovering. Now, pre-COVID, 19 major airports in the U.S. serviced direct nonstop flights to Japan. And since the reopening, we are seeing these departure points slowly return. And we're hoping to get back to those same daily flight numbers over time as well. So these direct flights don't just connect to places like Narita Airport, but other hubs around Japan, including airports like Kansai International that are a bit closer to hotspot destinations in Western Japan, like Osaka and Kyoto. So now once you're in the country for transportation, you'll find that Japan has some of the best transportation in the world. And passport holders are eligible to purchase the Japan Rail Pass. So this gives you unlimited rides on JR lines, which includes the Shinkansen bullet train, limited express and local lines, JR buses, and even a ferry, which I'll get to in just a bit. So this is a really great option for people looking to kind of hop from city to city or for little day trips out of those central hubs using the extensive train network. And it is available in seven, 14 and 21 day blocks. If you're an international license owner, you can rent a car and some car brands will even have English GPS. Um, but of course, arranging for private transfer is a great option as well. 
Now, uh, when you're getting around the country, there are a few different options for staying connected. So it is always a good idea to contact your phone carrier uh, to see what international plans they might have. But you can also invest in pocket Wi-Fi or a travel SIM. So you can typically find these at international arrivals. Um, so when choosing between the two, some things to consider are whether or not you need to make international calls um, and if your phone is unlocked, in which case a travel SIM is a great option. But if you don't really need to make calls so much, pocket Wi-Fi is a great way to go. Um, typically, these units will connect up to 10 devices at once. So this is really useful for families or larger groups. And you will find uh, as you go around Japan, some of those larger hubs and larger train stations, you will be able to find some free Wi-Fi as well. Now, Japan is considered one of the safest places to walk and travel around, and most people are really friendly and accommodating. So with common sense, you should get through your trip absolutely fine. Um, but if you find that you've lost an item or you yourself have become lost, just look for a koban. So these are basically small local police stations, um, and they can assist you with directions, maps, lost and found, as well as emergency services. Now, in terms of accommodations, Japan has many options. So, of course, you can stay at those well-known hotel brands that have Western-style rooms and those plush beds we're all uh, very accustomed to. Whereas if you want a bit more of a traditional experience, you can stay at a ryokan or a Japanese inn. So you get to enjoy sleeping on a futon and uh, enjoy those beautiful tatami floors. Another option that's popular in more rural areas is called minshuku. So this is basically a local bed and breakfast. Or if you want a really unique experience, you can try shukubo, which is where you stay overnight at a Buddhist temple. And this is actually a really great experience for vegetarians and vegans because you can uh, try shoujin ryori, which is traditional Buddhist cuisine, which doesn't use any animal uh, products or any dairy. So really a uh, great option. Now, as you're going around Japan, an important thing to remember is that it is a largely cash-based society, so it's always a good idea to have yen on hand. So, of course, you can uh, use currency exchange at the airports, but you can also order currency in bulk from your bank in advance. So if you do do this, um, you should let them know at least 24 to 48 hours in advance, just because many don't stock large amounts of foreign currency on hand. Now, when you're in the country, if you find your cash reserves running low, you can top yourself up at ATMs in 7-Elevens and also at the JP Post ATMs that you can find in post offices around the country. So there is a nominal fee and withdrawal fee, so you can check with your bank about how much this is. And also, it's good to check what your daily withdrawal limit is just so you can plan ahead. And remember, there is no tipping culture in Japan. So you'll find that if you leave a tip on your table at a restaurant, your waiter is going to be chasing you down the street to give you your forgotten change. All right, now shopping in Japan is also varied um, from department stores carrying those luxury brands we all know and love to 100 yen shops for really cheap uh, bulk souvenirs. You can also get some more traditional goods uh, from temple flea markets or historical craft shops. These are some of my favorite just because um, they have really rich history. You can get these great handmade items that really tell a story. So there are about 35,000 retail shops nationwide that are eligible for tax-free shopping. So you can see that logo in the top right corner there. So what this means is that if you make a purchase of over 5,000 yen or about $40, your purchase is tax-free. So all you need to do is present your passport to the shop attendant and they'll take care of the necessary paperwork. And of course, it's impossible to talk about Japan without talking about the food. So Japanese food is actually designated as a UNESCO intangible cultural heritage, and Tokyo alone has the most Michelin star rated restaurants in the world. And that's not just limited to Japanese food. You can find French, Italian, Chinese. There are so many options. Uh, and one misconception that we find people often have about uh, going out to eat in Japan is they think it's going to be this massive expense. But you don't have to go to really renowned five-star dining establishments to get really incredible food. You're just as likely to discover culinary gems from naturally wandering the cities that you're in, uh, stumbling on those hole-in-the-wall bars, cafes, and those charming mom-and-pop shops that actually serve up the best food in town. 
Now, a question people often ask us is when the best time to visit is. And the honest answer is there's really no wrong time to go. And that's because every season、uh, offers something really unique in Japan in regards to scenery, food, and activities. So, summertime, for example, is really great for water sports. You can catch some beautiful fireworks displays,、uh, join a summer festival. Autumn is a great time for countryside hikes because you get to see、uh, those beauty, beautiful、uh, autumn colors as the leaves change. And this is also harvest season.、Uh, so you get a lot of really incredible、uh, seasonal foods, some really woodsy, earthy flavors like mushrooms, potatoes, a lot of seasonal fish. Uh, winter is, of course, great for winter sports enthusiasts. And this is also kind of the quintessential time to soak in those hot springs and look out on the landscape.、Uh, and this is also a great time to catch some illuminations around the Christmas season. But of course,、uh, spring is ar arguably the most popular time to go. Everyone wants to catch those beautiful cherry blossoms. And this is a great season as well for river cruises. You'll see a lot of river banks in Japan are lined with those cherry trees. So, if you are wanting to see the cherry blossoms, one thing to remember is that they bloom from south to north. So, you'll find that warmer regions down south will see them as early as late January, while the northern regions、uh, will see them as late as early May. So, you can sort of plan your visit accordingly.、Um, but if you find that you've arrived a little too early or a little too late, you can sort of chase the blossoms in whichever direction. So, right now, for example,、um, cherry blossom season is wrapping up in the more central parts of Japan. But if you find your way a little bit more up north, you may be able to catch them in the coming weeks. And you can actually use this pattern and flip it around for the autumn leaves forecast. So、uh, they start changing up north and slowly move down south. So, for first timers to Japan, it's usually recommended that they take what's called the golden route. So, this gives visitors a really great snapshot of Japan because you do get a little bit of everything. You get that big city experience in Tokyo, you get some really great nature in the Mount Fuji Hakone area, some really great tradition and culture in Kyoto, and、uh, Osaka is a really great foodie destination. And this itinerary works really well as a pre post cruise route、um, since it is relatively short and a Adjustable. So I'll run through this route very briefly. So it starts off in Tokyo, which is one of the major international hubs. So it does make it sort of the perfect jumping off point to start your journey. And it is the center of pop culture, fashion, business, technology. And it's really easy to get around the city when you use services like the Tokyo Metro or the Hop On Hop Off Sky Bus. You can really plan a whole day out seeing some of the city's iconic landmarks like Sensoji Temple, Tokyo Sky Tree. You can visit the Tsukiji Fish Markets for some great seafood. And while most people don't really think of Tokyo as having much greenery, you can actually find lots of little pockets of nature throughout the city, ranging from traditional Japanese gardens to these sprawling, beautiful parks with seasonal blooms.、Uh, and then for outdoor activities, it's quite easy to just get a train to the outskirts for things like hiking, cycling, horseback riding, and more. So, just a short bullet train out of Tokyo is the next stop, Hakone. So, this is sort of where you get to catch your breath in nature after a few days on the go. So, the hot springs are the bread and butter of this area, and this is a really great place for an overnight in a traditional Japanese inn. So, you can really soak in those beautiful mineral waters, kick back, relax, get those views of Mount Fuji. Now, while you're in the area, you can ride the Hakone ropeway over the volcanic valley of Oakudani. So you can see those beautiful sulfur vents with the steam rising up. And then afterwards, you can hop on a sightseeing boat around Lake Ashi for some other really great views of Mount Fuji. And this area also has a few museums, like the Hakone Open Air Museum and the Okada Art Museum. It's really, really great for just a relaxing afternoon out. And then to get around the area, you can ride the Hakone Tozan Railway. So, this sort of doubles as a transportation method as well as a scenic activity. So, as you can see there, it does pass through a lot of really thick forests and tunnels. So, a lot of photographers will actually ride this、um, specifically to get perfect shots of the autumn colors as well as the summer hydrangea in early June. 
All right, so next up is Kyoto. So this is the ancient capital of Japan. And this is sort of your connection to traditional Japan on this itinerary. So it is home to about 2000 temples and shrines, as well as 17 UNESCO World Heritage Sites in and around the city. So there's quite a lot to take in here. Um, this is another really great destination for staying in a Japanese inn, or you can try out Shikubo, that temple lodging that I mentioned earlier. And Kyoto is also famous for its geisha. So this is a really great place for an ozashiki experience. So this is where you get to dine on a traditional meal while you're entertained uh, by geisha who uh, will be performing dances and songs for you, refilling your drinks, kind of chatting with you. But if you just want to catch a glimpse of them, uh, you can check out the Gion district. That's where uh, they wander. So that's uh, the geisha district in Kyoto, and you can even get fit in a kimono yourself just for a stroll around the town. But most people when they visit Kyoto absolutely need to hit up some of the temples and shrines. It's what it's really known for. Uh, most people will go to Kiyomizu Temple as well as the Fushimi Inari Taisha Shrine with those beautiful red tori gates. And if you want some nature, you can head out to Arashiyama to check out those really beautiful bamboo groves. All right, so just next door to Kyoto, actually, is Osaka, very, very close. Uh, so this is colloquially known as Japan's Kitchen, with over a thousand restaurants in the Dotonbori area. So this is a really great place to try what's called kui daure, which is the Japanese word for eat till you drop. So a lot of people will uh, restaurant hop and bar hop around here, trying all of that great street food, local delicacies. And the people in Osaka are really friendly and outgoing, so you're bound to make some friends as you travel around. So some of the specialty foods here include takoyaki and kushikatsu. These are some of my favorite, uh, really savory, pair very well with a cold glass of beer. Um, but you can find all sorts of really incredible street food here. And this is a very family friendly destination as well. There's a lot to do and see. Uh, you can head to Osaka Castle for a bit more tradition in the city center, or you can head to the Osaka Aquarium, Universal Studios Japan. Uh, you can go to the Umeda Sky Building for some great panorama ceramic views. Uh, there's a lot to do and see here. Now, a great day trip you can make from either Osaka or Kyoto is Nara. So this is about an hour out by train, and it's home to more UNESCO World Heritage Sites like Todaiji Temple. So this houses one of the largest bronze Buddha statues in Japan. But when people think of Nara, it's ubiquitous with the famous Nara deer. So these are deer that will freely wander around the park. They will stop in the middle of the street. They do not care. They are not afraid of people. Uh, so you can get nice and close to them. You can pet them. You can even feed them with deer crackers um, from the local vendors. And they are uh, also exceedingly polite. So fun fact is that if you bow to the Nara deer, they'll actually bow back to you. Just make sure to have some of those deer crackers on hand to feed them afterwards. Now, if you have a few more days, you can extend the golden route to include Hiroshima. So this is known for its natural beauty and its world heritage sites. And a lot of what you'd want to see is located really conveniently near Hiroshima Station. And there is a hop on hop off bus that JR Pass users uh, or holders can use to get around. Uh, so you can see some of those historical destinations like the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park, as well as nature like Shuke and Garden. And this is also a great place to try the local cuisine, uh, Hiroshima style okonomiyaki. So you can try classic okonomiyaki in Osaka and then go to Hiroshima to compare. This is where they use fried noodles instead of batter. Really, really good. Um, but uh, most visitors will also hop on a ferry that, again, your JR Pass can uh, get you across. So you get to cross the Seto Inland Sea, really short ride to Miyajima. So this is an island that's famous for the Itsukushima Shrine with that uh, beautiful red tori gate you can see on the top right there that looks like it's over the water. So this gate has actually been covered up for the last few years for some restoration work. Uh, so there was scaffolding all around it. People were pretty disappointed they couldn't snap photos, but it was just uncovered at the end of 2022, uh, just in time for everyone to enjoy it in its full splendor. So you can actually walk out to that gate um, during low tide for some close up photos. And then during high tide, it looks like it's floating over the water. 
Uh, so now in regards to cruising, Japan has over 30 major ports scattered throughout the country. So this is a really great destination for cruises to connect to some of those major hubs. So the two biggest ports that people will often pass through on uh, cruises are Yokohama and Kobe. So these connect you to Tokyo and Osaka, respectively. So this is where a lot of cruise ships will begin and end their journeys, allowing for really easy pre-post cruise access to itineraries like the Golden Route. So I'll talk a little bit about some of these ports just to give you an idea of what they have to offer. So Yokohama is a short train ride away from Tokyo proper. So this is where most people will fly into as one of the major international hubs before boarding their cruises. Um, and you'll find a vast majority of them do start from this point. But the city itself has a lot of really unique charm. Uh, so for example, the ramen museum is really great in Shin Yokohama, where you can learn about the culture and history of ramen, learn how it's made, you can make your own uh, and taste the different regional styles from across Japan. Uh, the Motomachi area is great for shopping, and there's also the Yokohama Chinatown as well for some really great street food. Uh, you can go to the Satoyama Gardens for some nature, and the Yokohama Zoo is right nearby, so really great for an afternoon with the family. And just in general, the waterfront area has some really beautiful bayside views. Now, the other major port uh, that cruises often pass through is Kobe, which is just next door to Osaka and Kyoto. So it's a really easy access point to and from Western Japan. So most people do recognize this city for its most famous culinary production, which is Kobe beef. So it's supposed to be so marbled that it melts in your mouth. So it is a little bit pricey, but well worth it. And then Kobe Harbor um, serves as a really lively port area with a lot of entertainment and quality restaurants. And Kobe also has its own Chinatown with more incredible street food. Uh, you can get some great views of the city from the Akashi Kaiko, Kaikyo Bridge. Um, and you can also enjoy some sake in the Nada district. You can soak in some more hot springs in Arima Onsen. There's a lot to do uh, to relax here before heading to the next stop of your journey. However, uh, during your cruising, you will find yourself with stopovers in other regions in Japan. And this ranges from the subarctic north to the subtropical south and everything in between. So I do want to highlight just a few other notable port cities, uh, talk a little bit about what they have to offer. So we'll jump across the map a little and we'll start way up north in Hokkaido. So this is the northernmost island of Japan that's known for its mild summers and very cold winters. So this is a really great place to beat the heat in the summer or to enjoy winter sports in those colder months. And it does have multiple port cities. So one of these port cities is Hakodate. So this is at the southern tip of Hokkaido and it's famous for its fresh seafood and really incredible views. So this was actually one of the first ports in Japan to welcome foreign trade when the country reopened in the Meiji period. So this is in the mid 1800s. So you can really see that influence reflected in the architecture in areas like the Motomachi district. It almost resembles an old San Francisco. You've got these really steep streets, cable cars, Victorian buildings, and really beautiful bay views as well. So for some really great views, you can actually ride a ropeway up Mount Hakodate, which many people will go to at night, like you can see in that photo, to get um, that really beautiful glittering city below. Um, or you can also get views of the Goryokaku Fort, which is an old fortress turned public park. There's a tower nearby where you can get that really nice uh, photo of it. And this is also one of Hokkaido's major fishing ports. So this is a great place to head to the morning markets and you can try the fresh catches of the day like salmon roe, sea urchin, crab, all sorts of different seafood. And honestly, Hokkaido in general is kind of considered a foodie destination. They've got really great whiskey, really great ramen, beer, really great creamy ice cream and cheese. So you're going to have your hands full trying to fit in all of the different bites into your visit. All right, so we'll move down a little bit south to Tohoku. So this region is known for its countryside vistas, lots of really beautiful mountainscapes, uh, lakes, rivers, and it's also the leading producer of rice in the nation. And uh, when you get rice, you get really great sake. So lots of really great sake breweries here. 
So at the northernmost part of this region is Aomori. So this area is really well known for its nature and really unique culture. So if you thought America was famous for its apple pie, wait till you visit Aomori. So this area is famous countrywide for its apples. So this is a really great destination during harvest season in the summer and autumn. You can try apple picking, enjoy some regional ciders and sweets, even soak in an apple hot spring. Uh, for art lovers, you can, in the summer, check out the rice paddy art in this tiny village uh, called Inakadate that you can get a bus out to, or you can head to the Aomori Museum of Art. Um, nature lovers will really love this area. You can hike around Oirase Gorge in any season for some really great photos. You can cycle around Lake Towada. But if you're around uh, in early August, you can catch the famous Nebuta Festival. So this is one of the largest festivals in the Tohoku region. So it's known for those massive uh, washi paper floats that you can see in that photo there that depicts Japanese Shinto gods, historical figures. Um, and it's also accompanied by drummers, flute and hand cymbal players, dancers, absolutely a must see if you head there. And then finally, we'll be jumping down to Shikoku. So this is the smallest of the four major islands in Japan, and it's known for really great weather, as well as lots of great outdoor activities. So Kochi serves as the main port for Shikoku, uh, and the coastlines here attract surfers from all over, very, very famous for it. And you can see that it's lined by the Pacific Ocean as well at the bottom there. So it has access some really great to some really great seafood. Um, the Hirome Market is one of the more well-known uh, attractions there. It's basically a culinary wonderland. So you can sort of wander around, try the different local specialties like skipjack tuna and imo kempi or sweet potato fries. It's some of my favorites, uh, as well as other really great fried food. Uh, and you can pair those really well with sake breweries, uh, sake in this area too. Um, and if you're interested in history, Kochi Castle is a great place to visit. It's 400 years old, uh, really beautiful in the spring with those cherry blossoms. And across from it is the Kochi Castle Museum of History. So you can learn a little bit about it in depth. But this area in general is just really well known for its great weather, uh, especially in the spring and summer. Uh, so it's a really popular destination for adventure travel. Uh, you can white water raft here. You can take day trips to Cape Ashizuri for some great ocean views. Or you can walk a section of the Shikoku 88 Temple pilgrimage. Uh, so really a lot of great outdoor activities here. So I know I covered quite a lot in a very short period of time, uh, but hopefully these destinations have inspired you to learn a little bit more about Japan, all the other beautiful places in the country, and have given you some ideas for when you uh, travel there. Uh, so lastly, I have a short video for you that will also hopefully inspire you on your travels. All right, so for more information, um, you can visit JNTIA's website as seen here. And of course, if you have any questions about Japan, you're more than welcome to contact one of our offices. Uh, I'm from the Los Angeles uh, office, but we do have another domestic branch in New York as well. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Melinda. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Rose. Excellent presentation. Lots of information, like you said. I did forget to mention, so I'll mention it right now. If there's questions you'd like to ask, there is a chat box. You should see a little thing up in the top that says two little 
computer monitors. And if you want to put in your chat and then questions, and we'll answer those in just a few minutes. We're getting ready to finish up. I'm going to show you just a little bit about a cruise that we're talking about in March of 2024, which is really just right around the corner. Obviously, we can do Japan any way that you think is great, whether you want to take it and do it independently, you want to do it by train, you want to stay in Yoakens. I've done all that. It's a fantastic way to do it. Uh, but in end with a cruise, we can do both. We can actually put you on a 10-night cruise, which obviously if you're flying that long distance, you probably want to do longer. So with this cruise, we would absolutely add a three-night in Tokyo to start and then get you on the cruise. Um, but when you look at all of this, when you look at the cruise and you look at Japan, um, for 10 nights with all your accommodations, and, and you can see the itinerary right over here, um, you have the onboard meals, your drinks, your specialty coffees, premium desserts, onboard entertainment, Wi-Fi gratuities, and that's starting what I would recommend the balcony cabin at $3,509 per person, and honestly, that's a fantastic deal. So let's just go to the next slide, and we'll see what... Um, so if you were thinking I want to do a cruise, or like I said, this is just one option. As I said, we originally had one that we were going to discuss in October, and it's completely sold out. So I would recommend booking as soon as you're ready. Um, but with this one, if you wanted to book this 10-night uh, cruise with a three-night pre in Tokyo, we would need a, uh, only $100 per person deposit, and would include your that would be all you would need to hold this. Um, up until 419 and then after that, it's actually a special going on right now. It would be $400 per person. So for $100 per person, that would hold your cruise, and your balance would not be due until December 5th. And then we'd have airfare. Airfare is out 11 months in advance, so right in April, 11 months in advance of your return, we'd be able to get the airfare as well. So it's just an opportunity to see what's there. Um, but Travel Central, as we start at the beginning, we are the one hosting this with Japan National Tourism Organization. We are so glad you joined us. Again, if you have questions, please put it in the chat box. We are your ultimate travel resource. We are trained professionals, as I said in the beginning, who make sure that we keep up with the local, what's going on in the industry, and then make sure you're completely prepared for your vacation from the moment you call us to the moment you return home. We are your advocate and handle any challenges, schedule changes, or any questions you might have just in general about your vacation. With that, I'm going to say thank you. I'm going to wait one more second to make sure nobody has any questions. I hope you enjoyed this. We did record it. We'll be putting it on our YouTube channel as well as sending out an email to those who have registered for the event in advance. Thank you for joining us. Rose, fabulous job. Love it. Uh, look forward to doing another one with you because it is a destination that people love to hear and learn more about um, prior to travel. And so I do appreciate that you all take this time and do it with us. Okay. Thank you well, so much. Like we, okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.